Welcome to Microsoft Virtual Academy, Windows Security and Forensics class. I am Erdoleskaya. I'm glad to be here with you again. And today I have the Wolf with me, Hassan. Thank you, thank you. My name is Hassan Shikarti. I work for TrueSec. Uh, work as a cybersecurity advisor. Um, started as a developer back in time and then uh, moved from there into uh, networking, identity management, uh, Windows, Linux, Unix, you name it. Uh, every single type of, of operating system I've been seeing and working with so far. Um, as I said, identity management and network security and, and forensic penetration testing is quite well what I work with today. You are also on Microsoft? Uh, Microsoft uh, MVP, um, Enterprise Security, which is turning into um, cloud and data center management very soon. That will be interesting. Cool. I'm still Odell. You probably remember that's my third MEA. First one was Defense in Depth. Please go ahead and watch it. Second one was about Enterprise Security. and. Um, I'm completing my PhD, have two master's degrees, and I'm also an MVP, like I was saying. Mm -hmm. Working, loving security, and today we are going to cover lots of cool and important stuff that you all have to uh, listen carefully because instead of talking too much, let's go straight into yeah. it. So, what is in our course? We will cover six topics and one bonus topic, hopefully. So we will cover Windows security and forensics with the landscape of today, mm -hmm. what is going on. Then we will cover the Windows memory attacks and forensics. Hassan, I know you prepared us really great demos. Mm -hmm. We will move from there to authentication attacks. Later, we're going to have also Raymond here, another MVP. With him, we're going to talk about Windows forensics. We will talk about network forensics and malware incident response. At the very end, hopefully, I'm going to be able to show you Windows 10 forensics, where it's going to cover the changes in Windows mm -hmm. 10 and what you should know as forensic expert. This level, it's between 2 and actually 400, but we're going to stick to 2 and 300 level. Some of the stuff might get a bit advanced, but we prepared some slides for you where you can go and learn a lot. Okay, what are we covering in this module, Hassan? Well, we're going to have a good look at uh, how the landscape is changing in terms of what's happening out there. How are the bad guys acting? How are the good guys should be acting um, on those actions? Um, a lot of things are changing. Um, the, the, the hackers or attackers are using modern tools like PowerShell, and we still see very automated attacks going on there. Um, uh, so the effectivity level has been very, very, very much higher now than before. Uh, of course, we will uh, be touching on what's happening on the Windows uh, ecosystem per se, uh, what's happening with the Windows security um, ecosystem, uh, what kind of functions do we see there and expect, how can we use the same kind of tools and methods the bad guys are using as an admin to recover from uh, bad situations or, or breaches or anything that actually happens with us. Um, so this is basically our um, main, main topic for, for some of the or parts of the sessions for today. Um, and we'll, as, at the end of this module, we'll give you a good demo about how we should um, consider or, or look at modern attacks and where they are hide, hiding and what kind of tools we should use to be able to seek for them. Cool. Then let's start with the security landscape. Mm. All right. We know there is lots of changes. So security is, um, I think the only change which doesn't change is the change, let, change word itself, right? Yeah. So we know people are really active in the internet. And I think you will remember this slide from my first MEA. So many things happen online in, in a minute. Mm. We all do many stuff on the internet, especially today, a good Microsoft approach, which is Mobility first, cloud first, yeah. or cloud first, mobility first, is a fact that we're going to even be more involved mm -hmm. with being online. All right, Hassan, uh, we know cybercrime is not a hobby anymore. Yeah. It's actually a business. Yeah. There are a lot of money involved in that. There are a lot of other type of interest involved in that as well. I mean, we see everything from... Uh, uh, people who are doing do, doing this for, for for the money, and then we do have people doing this for um, uh, the uh, attacking other maybe countries. We we see the the state uh, financed activities appearing here and there uh, from time to other, and we see um, a mixture of that as well. There are all kind of of uh, 
uh, reasons behind why people are conducting cyber attacks nowadays. It it's, could be political, it could be uh, somebody is fighting for a specific reason and then they will target a specific site or a business or something like that. Uh, they are un unhappy with the vendor or unhappy with some kind of political uh, agenda, and then they will be targeting those um, those sites representing or those uh, enterprises representing that agenda, for instance. So yes, we do have all kind of reasons uh, why we do see uh, cyber attacks going on today. Uh, it's not just the hobbyists, it's not just the, the normal hackers we used to, to know. We have them. the nation states, yeah. we have the, I mean, beside, I mean, we categorize them white, mm. blue, blue, uh, gray, blue hat is the Microsoft, I don't know how I came <laughs> with blue hat, uh, gray, white, and black hat, yeah. but um, yeah. we know the cyber criminals, or today the governments also are hiring their own cyber army, of course. and uh, it's public that many governments launch attacks, yeah. even in corporations, and Sony was yeah. a good example on this. All right, so the landscape of today is a bit interesting. When we check the news, you will see that there are so many things happening. I mean, I don't have to mm. really uh, talk about each and every single attack. I remember many, many years ago, we used to uh, have cybersecurity news very, very, very occasionally in the front page. Mm. But today, I don't see a day, nearly a day, yeah, where there is no news, right? Yeah, so right. people believe they have the best security solutions. Mm. They believe a product, a vendor, a solution will protect them. That's but right. together today, we're going to show that mm. um, security it by itself is nothing. So it has to be chained to each other to be able to have the right and yeah, perfect solution. Right. Yeah, basically you have to know what, what kind of assets are you trying to protect. Uh, if you don't have that information, then whatever you put as a protection measures, that will be basically not worth the money you spend on it. So uh, without making a, a correct assumption on what type of assets are most important in our enterprise or organization, uh, we will be losing money and we're basically bleeding resources. Um, so it's not the product by itself, mm. it's also the people, the value that we give That's as right. training and this course, for example, is going to help hopefully uh, organizations, governments to be more secure. Mm. All right. I think we all understand why we need Windows. Yeah. But why do we need Windows security? Well, um, we obviously need to secure our systems against unauthorized un, um, access. Uh, we do have a lot of assets we need to protect in our environment. So um, um, that being said, we need to understand what kind of, of uh, components and products and details and those components and products we can utilize to offer ourselves and our customers and our employees a decent level of security. Well, I'm saying a decent level of security simply because we cannot offer 100 percentage coverage for everything that might happen. We, we don't even know about what is possible to happen. Uh, we can imagine some things because we've seen things going on. We know about some kind of attacks and so forth, but we don't have the big picture in front of us. Uh, things are changing daily. Things are changing over time. Uh, we do uh, push forth and back our business uh, services um, on-premise to the cloud and so forth. And we need to deal with those new situations appearing along the path. So uh, we need to figure out what the operating system, what the ecosystem we're using is able to offer us in terms of protection mechanism and protection components. Um, and that's changing quite a lot nowadays. Uh, we've seen a, a new shifting in the area where Microsoft is, is really uh, start focusing very, very much on security features and platform. And a lot of things are happening now with the release of Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016, for instance. Okay, mm. then I think it's really good to talk about the revolution of the cyber threats, right? Yeah. And uh, I got a beautiful slide here, and I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure you are the best person to explain that. Um, probably all of you, you don't know that. Hussein, Ro um, I mean, uh, I remember during the war in Iraq, mm -hmm. while you were escaping, he wrote his first program without even owning a computer. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a true story, um, which hopefully later he can uh, tell us the details. Yeah. But... When we look in the security cyberspace, 
uh, in 1977, when I was mm. born, we had just viruses, and the first, I think it was a uh, Apple Mac virus, right? The yeah, Apollo well, virus. Well, r right before that, we had uh, the first virus that spread very widely. It was here in the States and the university networks. Uh, it was an experiment if you could uh, make a piece of software that could replicate itself to, to other computers and was using some kind of glitch or problem in the send mail system. And that worked very well. So uh, we, uh, we remember that as the first self-spreading uh, virus ever. And then from there, we have the, the, the landscape you're laying out in, 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 in that slide. So, uh, so it started to yeah. website attacks. I remember back then, again, IS4 was one mm -hmm. of the most hacked mm -hmm. websites, right? And it was yeah. really cool to hack websites. Then uh, I remember early 2000, Melissa came out, the mm -hmm. uh, malicious code, which was replicating itself as well. Then it started to get new, um, new uh, A variant, B variant, C variant, yeah. which was the advanced worm Trojan, which was called I Love You. The I Love You, the NIMDA, the, the um, uh, Code Red stuff. You know, I was trying to yeah, just summarize. All, yeah, all of that. I mean, uh, this was uh, a good, good old days, I yeah, believe. Yeah. Then phishing attack and like, I remember a few years ago, we done uh, with you at Microsoft Tech at now called mm -hmm, Ignite a Phishing mm -hmm. Attack. And I never ever forget, one of the feedback was, hey, <laughs> we are in year 2013 and you're showing you phishing attack? still doing that? And yeah. yes, it was one of the feedback just six months later. Mm -hmm. I believe that gentleman was working for well, us. Well, bank. that's actually <laughs> the most effective attack vector we know about today, simply because the legit users sitting behind the, the keyboards and, and having access to the information, if I can trick any of these to click on my executable and download that and run it on their PC, then I will have the same amount of access to that information as they do have. So it's still the most effective one. And we remember quite big attacks that happened a few years ago. Just recently, yeah. uh, one billion dollar, mm. which is equal to one ton, uh, of weight, money was physically stolen with a simple phishing attack. Yeah. We don't have to go really much back. That's February this year. Mm -hmm. um, after that, those attacks, uh, data theft has started to be popular. Mm. But things are changing. As cybercrime is not a hobby anymore, the evolution of the attacks started to evolve as well. 2003, we, ha we used to have script kiddies. Everybody mm. who had access to Metasploit, Kali, or uh, similar software, they thought they were hackers, yeah. but the volume was high, the impact was low. But in 2005, hackers started to be even much smarter. They started to organize the crime. Mm -hmm. They started to attack uh, the target the attacks. That's and right. after 2012, as I was just trying to say, nation state, activists, terror groups mm. has started to be really, really, really uh, effective and the impact started to be high as yeah. well. We had a very, a very interesting inter incident that happened this summer that a, a security firm was attacked, a security company was attacked. Ah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we're not Which mentioning any hacking, names, right? but yeah, there was a quite interesting attack where they actually, uh, uh, I guess, under a couple of months or even more than so, uh, had full control over that company's uh, all assets, all their software, source, uh, source code. code was published on the net, all their customers, yeah, invoices. customer information, invoices, everything, all their uh, uh, social media accounts were, were compromised and they started to act as that company in to up to 100%. Uh, very interesting scenario. I, I doubt they like it, but <laughs> the, 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 that company, but it's very interesting that they are going this far this time. Um, yeah, I think it was a really good point. Mm. So hackers are getting smarter, uh, which means we have to get smarter as well. And thanks yeah. to Microsoft Virtual Academy, who brought us here together mm. to be able to demonstrate what this guy's doing. So what are the cybersecurity concerns present? If you look at the global attacks, the cost is increasing and rising every single second. Cybercrime extracts between 15 and 20% of the value created by the internet. Um, we can look in each and every country one by one. The result is not going to change. Mm. The cost, the effect is really getting high. Yeah. And the impact, I think they say, could be as much as $3 trillion, 
uh, in loss on productivity and growth. To be honest, I can't even imagine how much money three trillion is. Yeah. Or it's not always money. Uh, Tappen in uh, Middle East, one of the ver world's largest oil companies was hacked. Yeah. And they were slowed down, what, by 60-70% on productivity? Mm -hmm. So it's not always money. So the cost as now is keep changing. Mm. And I believe this will bring us to the point why we need to understand forensics. Yeah. Okay, security is good, hacking is good, now we are hacked, okay. What's gonna happen after you're hacked? I mean, we call, hey, TrueSec, Hassan, can you please come and help me? So you have to do some, uh, how we call it, forensics? Yeah, or an investigation, actually. It's a First more, more or less a digital investigation, what we call it forensics. So forensics is all about putting the pieces together. It's all about, you have um, uh, artifacts, you have pieces of information that might or might not be interested. Um, and then you try to put them together. You try to build the timeline, what happened, at what time uh, point in time and so forth, what systems were, were affected and so on. Uh, so that's what it's all about. It's just gathering the pieces and try to lay them out so you got an understandable timeline so you see what exactly or more or less exactly what happened. Uh, sometimes it's pretty easy, sometimes it's pretty difficult. Um, sometimes you need to do a lot more than other occasions. You need to copy disks or just gather data of the network. Uh, or maybe quite gigantic amounts of data sometimes. Um, and quite often we don't have enough uh, logs, enough audit trails. When, whenever something happens, we, we lack the ability to trace it because the company or, or the organization didn't thought about that before. So if they already been um, um, introduced to, to hacker activities before, uh, you will most probably find that they do have some kind of audit trails and logging. If, if they've never been in that position before, um, you will most often see that they don't have that kind of ability to present um, traces of what happened. And then sometimes they might already acted way too much on those machines. A uh, machine that was hacked it has been replaced or reinstalled or uh, reformatted or something like that. And then we all of a sudden losing a whole lot of valuable information that might be caught if we would do a correct investigation, digital investigation, or forensic investigation on that one. Okay, this brings us to the question, why do we need to learn about computer forensics, or these days called mm. digital forensics? Yeah. What is a digital forensics? It's something known as uh, science. When a breach happens, what will happen is uh, we have to know how we can, what is going on and this, what happened? Mm. What's going on and how can we recover this? It's a science of collecting, analyzing, and reporting on digital data in a way that can be presented in yeah. a court as evidence as well, right? Okay, I believe Hassan hacked me. Proof it. Mm. I have to be able to analyze the computer, collect information, and write a report which I can um, submit it to the yeah. court. So why it's called digital forensics? Because it's not a computer anymore, yes. Mm. Early 70s, early 80s, was computers, but today we have the mobile phones, we have the TV, smart TVs, yeah. we have um, tablets, Surface, Surface Pro, mm -hmm. or we, you know, we have all these digital aspects. Uh, the digital, digital footprints. Footprint or, yeah. that we need to look into it. Mm. So it is like any other science. It has a forensic, forensic medicine, a ballistics, a psychology, a chemistry, yeah. engineering, a criminology, and uh, some other stuff that we cannot cover right now. Mm. Okay, why do we need forensics? Because it's a method of techniques which will help us to investigate. And Dr. Wolf, which is uh, very similar <laughs> to your name, that's why I took it up, said here a beautiful saying, a methodological series of techniques and produce procedures for gathering evidence from computing equipment and various storage devices and digital media mm. that can be presented in a court of law in a coherent and meaningful format. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to add some, some small Please. things to that. Please. So you are, here's Dr. Wolf and you are the book. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, everything we read, uh, which is publicly available about digital forensic, it often goes into the, the, the um, about to, speaking about the legislation part of it. 
I want to use this in court. I want to prove that this happened uh, in front of other people or something like that. But what we see in real life that uh, there are many forensics activities or investigations being carried out and that information will never be shared with the law enforcement. It's only internal investigation that an organization or, or enterprise is performing simply because they want to understand what kind of breach they had, how much information was leaked, what kind of effect that will put on their customers and then their services and so the on. The research groups, right? Yeah, and not necessarily to share that with law enforcement. Now, we do have uh, 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 some changes in that landscape as well. We do have, based on the recent changes in the, in the legislation, uh, there are reasons why to publish that information and why to share it with, with law enforcement. And sometimes uh, there is more or, or less an obligation to do that as well. So that's changing, uh, especially here, here in the States. Um, in Europe, we're still working with that. Um, we're still dealing with that type of changes in, in the European Union. And I guess in the other parts of the world, we will be doing that as well. Um, so, so just to, to yeah, give yeah, some... that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, um, clearance on that. And a good example, me as academic in Charleston University, mm -hmm. I set honeypots to be able to see what hack, uh, you know, how yeah. hackers comes, and it's my job to analyze collected data, not giving mm. it to uh, the court, of course, in this case, making sure, uh, learning how mm. they do, and we as cybersecurity advisors then, uh, letting our customers know how they can be protected. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, you can get help by Microsoft if you're using their cloud services today, you can get all these advanced uh, analytic reports and so on. So they will be analyzing uh, your data in terms of your users connecting to services. If you allow them, yes. Consuming services, how do you are doing that? Uh, do we see any anomalies? Are users coming and going from places or on the internet they aren't supposed to be there at, at the same time they are at their laptops at home or something like that? So we, we're getting that kind of information as well from the big vendors today. What I can recommend at Channel 9, if you go to your speakers, look under my name, Erdal Oskaya, you should be able to see a session called Windows Azure Security. And there, actually, I'm, gonna de uh, I'm demonstrating how you can, uh, what Hassan said, it's a beautiful session and demonstration. Please go ahead and watch it later. Hassan has also a really good sessions there, which I always recommend. But now back to digital mm -hmm. forensics. It's like an iceberg, right? The top is the casual, casual observer, yeah. which is the Windows Explorer, command line, or PowerShell, the browser. Mm. But when we investigate deeply, we will see that it's more sophisticated. It may include deleted data, mm -hmm. or hidden data, or unauthorized information and records of illegal activities. Yeah. And it happens a lot, where uh, we get invited by uh, police to investigate a computer because someone is doing some sort of legal, illegal mm -hmm. activity, mm -hmm. which dating, uh, deleting the computer, or sometimes uh, f um, encrypting the computer is gonna keep them away. Yeah. We have some techniques that we're gonna cover, uh, how we can uh, recover this information. Mm. So, digital forensic is, Computer forensics, memory forensics, network forensics, mobile forensics, all combined. Yeah. And today, we are not gonna go much into the mobile forensics, but we will cover deeply uh, Windows, memory, and network forensics, mm. and hopefully you're gonna understand the reasons why do we need to do the forensic analysis. Yeah. Hassan, can you please tell us uh, why do we need really a forensic analysis? What are the reasons? Uh, well, as I said before, it's, it's simply about you got that, those pieces of information, you need to put them together, you need to, to recreate what happened. Um, so that's what, what your major task will be. That's why you, you need to conduct that type of analysis. Um, uh, it, we, we used to call them artifacts. These are pieces of information, not necessarily related to each other. So if you look at them at the first sight, and then when you start looking at them a little bit deeper to understand how the relationship looks like, then you will be able to build relations between these components. Um, so, that, so that's the type of typical activity we will be doing when looking at those uh, pieces of information. So later we're going to show it in demos, but mm. we have to be able to identify what's going on in this computer. Yeah. Then, if possible, you have to preserve it. Mm. To be able to preserve it, we have to extract it. Mm. To be able to extract it, um, we have to play with it, 
And after that, we have to be able to document it. Yeah. We have to be able to explain it, interpret it in a way, in a presentable format, where either in mm. a court or in a security advice or in a white paper, this can be explained. Yeah. So it's really important that we understand how security is involved, actually working very closely with forensics. Mm -hmm. And if you look mm -hmm. at the title, security and forensics, of course, as marks of MEPs, uh, today we're covering Windows, but this involves in Linux, this yeah. involves in Apple, in Google, in Amazon Cloud, and everything. Mm -hmm. But our focus will be as uh, MVPs for today and uh, being a Microsoft Studio, yeah. only in Windows and area. So uh, I always tell my students, my customers, that forensics is not just insecurity. It's mm. proactive. Uh, but it can be reactive based on the request. And yeah. you gave really good examples on this. It's sometimes about, it's more in, about finding information about bad guys or criminals, and it could be in evidence, or as we're gonna do it later demo, could be malware, yeah. which um, is an ATP, which reports somehow information to uh, in a different way. Mm. And I know you and your workmates, let's say hello to Marcus from here, <laughs> you do many penetration testings, That's which right. I do as well. Mm. Um, then we make sure that our customers are ready uh, to be more secure, yeah. not ready, uh, but they are, you know, they are able to, they, they are able to uh, push back the yeah, attacks. Re react or get react. the feel and, and look for how, how that kind of an attack could be. Uh, that's why they need us, right? Yeah, it's perfect that you, area. Yeah, it's perfect that you're bringing up penetration tests because that could be uh, um, a simulation or it could be used as a simulation. You let some uh, a group uh, conduct an attack on your organization and you know about that and you you want to test your readiness you want to test your uh, whatever type of enforcement you've, you've put in place in terms of, of uh, uh, traceability or uh, any proactive type of, of measures you have in place if you see am I getting those alarms and uh, do we have people that are able to react do we have people that can collect those uh, artifacts, those traces, and put them together and then present the whole picture for us. So we'll have maybe two teams, a red and a blue team. The red will be trying to attack and penetrate the system. The blue team will try to look at what's happening in the background and try to fix it meanwhile or just observe it to, to be able to build the picture about what's happening. The difference between us ethical hackers and uh, mm. uh, hackers is we, as penetration test security advisors, Yes, uh, we, we usually get paid to hack, mm. but we are not uh, there to damage. We yeah. will simulate how a hacker can in, how they can steal information, mm. and it's our job, but why the blue teams, to protect yeah. before the hackers damage. So at the end, yes, uh, we do, I mean, mm. I know you do also for charities as well, uh, I do lots of charity work as well. I don't charge most of the time uh, some of the non-profit-making uh, companies, but uh, at the end, the aim is the same, making money, but our one is the legal way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the fun part of it is, I remember years ago, yeah. when I was an instructor, I used to deliver certified ethical hacking class, mm -hmm. and my son, uh, you know, in the kindergarten, true story, he was telling, oh, my dad is a hacker. Yeah. And he was telling his friends, the teacher was surprised, she called, said, Mr. Skaya, yes? Is it true that you're a hacker? I said, mm, not really, I'm a penetration tester. And she said, a what? <laughs> um, a hacker, a hacker. You know, I was yeah. trying, I'm going to explain penetration testing. It's, to, it's easier that way. Yes, I said, uh, <laughs> we hack for a cause. A cause, yes, to make you more secure. Yeah. That's what we do in reality. Mm -hmm. And it's a true story which I always uh, laugh and remember. Well, well, what we see happening in real life as well, uh, most of the hackers will try to keep the systems they, they get control over uh, alive, simply because that will be a way to gain more money or gain more influence. Um, you don't, you don't want to build a, a bot network where the bots are not working. So you want to simply keep them alive, and, and sometimes those who, who operate and own those bot networks will make sure that the computers will get updated, the computers will, will actually get uh, um, uh, protected against being hacked by other groups. 
So they will, will keep the persistent protect active, their own IP. Yeah, protect the, their own uh, assets because that's the new asset they own. Their own assets, you yeah. mean, right? Yeah. I'm assets. Uh, you hack my system. It's now your assets. Yeah, it's virtually somebody else. Somebody yes. else. Yeah. Um, for this, we again, uh, if you watch the previous MBAs mm. that I recorded, we covered there. I said, hey, there's five puzzles and. The fourth phase, which is the uh, maintaining access part, is yeah. really important because otherwise someone else is going to steal it from you. And yeah, there right. is a beautiful saying as well, which I remember now. If you're not the master, mm -hmm. you are controlled by the master, right? Yeah. So you better use your own IP <laughs> to be able to keep the hacking business. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we are here to tell the good stories, not mm -hmm. bad stories. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Probably uh, this is the next point. What do we need to be a forensics analyst? First of all, we need some tools, right? Hardware and software tools to acquire data during our investigation. Yeah. We need to understand the laws because you can't just say, hey, I feel like uh, I feel uh, I feel like browsing your computer mm -hmm. and no, we need some uh, permissions. That's right. And more importantly, uh, we have to know the laws, how we can do forensics. Yeah. And how much, basically, how much to be able to tamper with whatever you have in your hands. Uh, basically, you don't want to do that. You don't, you just want to keep it as original state as possible. Um, so making copies of whatever on your hard drives or in memory, if possible. So don't even switch off the computer if you, if you can do that. Um, so with the right tools, you can have uh, memory images created uh, in real time without switching off the computers. Of course, that kind of activity have a cost uh, related to it, but um, it is possible if you, if you value the information that's been uh, attacked um, in a certain way. So we need to make sure that we have a proper copy of, of the system, and we never actually uh, try to avoid using the system itself. We try to look at the copies rather than looking at the system. And uh, whenever we, we need to look at the system itself, we need to make sure the copies are authentic. So um, This we're going to cover yeah. in details anyway. Yeah. Um, but for that, uh, I, I like Hussein's office in uh, Sweden. <laughs> uh, it's literally a big safe door. It used to be an ex-bank, and yeah. he delivers some training there as well. You have to really, it is a huge uh, lock. That's the door right. is a huge lock. Uh, but I want you to quickly have a look in the pictures, please. Mm. This is a photo which I took from our lab. Uh, you will see a distance duplicator here. Um, and from a different angle, we have uh, disk duplicators, different brands. Mm. This is to duplicate a disk. Why? Because you are not allowed to work in the original yeah. disk, right? Then we need some write blockers to protect the original data. I mean, there are so many different brands. You can have a look into those. Then we have disk urses. Okay, now you work for government. What are you going to do? Mm. For example, it's your job to destroy the data so nobody else can um, recover it. Yeah. Uh, for this, we have to understand what chain of custody is. Mm. Chain, of, chain of custody is a roadmap that tells how evidence is collected, analyzed, and preserved. Yeah. It ensures auditing of the original data evidence and tracking the logs is accurated. In this case, it's a set of rules for us how we can collect, analyze, store the data, and present it in a court. Yeah. Okay, if it's not a court, then we should know how to write a white paper, right? Yeah, or uh, just a report. To the report present. to a boss, or yeah. to do a presentation like us right now for hopefully hundreds and thousands of people. Mm. Um, maybe it was a good estimation. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure that you share this course with your friends. It's yeah. free, and the good thing is, you know, once they complete it, they will get also a certificate from um, Microsoft Virtual yeah. Academy. All right, here's an example of the form. If you quickly look on the screen, it needs to have the date, the type of incident, you should tap on the case number. Uh, if it's a hard drive, for example, the model, the manufacturer name, the serial number, yeah. descriptions. So. It has many rules that we are not able to cover. I mean, uh, usually forensic classes, five days. I know you give some mm. forensic classes as well, three days, five days, depends yeah. on the knowledge. But how is your life? I mean, 
I'm gonna tell mine, but you are my guest today here. Uh, this is like my home studio now. <laughs> uh, the crew, you're there, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm here every two months to make sure they're secure enough. Mm -hmm. So how is your day as a forensic analyst? I know you're a security analyst, but I know mm -hmm. you do also forensics, mm -hmm. but how is your day? Your eight, hour, eight hours, assuming, Workday as a forensic analyst. Yeah, I mean the the, the hardest part is try to understand uh, what happened. Uh, there are different versions of what happened. There you have the customer or or the enterprise itself, and then you have the users themselves, and so on. And you have the people behind these the scenes, those who um, admin, sysadmins or network admins or um, storage admins or whatever part of the system that was involved in, in an attack or something like that. So trying to put together those uh, pieces of information. What's your story? What what did actually happen? What what's you, what are you convinced about? This thing happened. I know that this has changed or this has been altered or something like that. And the other part, the other very difficult part, uh, is to understand how the system is built. What is the usage scenario for the system? What is legal? What is illegal? What is okay to do or what is not. Um, and then we will start looking for, for um, dependency descriptions, um, uh, relationships between systems and so forth, because we really need to understand what's going on in, in, in normal situations to understand whether this is a normal situation or not, or it has been carried out by an internal legit user, or is this an external attack altogether or something like that. So we need we need to get that picture, and it's not that very easy all the time to get it. You might get some pieces of information, and then you need to put them in that context. And that's, that's typically where we spend most time on, try to put them together in that context to see, to be able to build up the scenario we're looking for. So that's a good way to explain mm. it. Thank you, Hussain. So the guidelines, we talked about it, but what I believe is it's everything is about the data, right? Yeah. It's the computers, the laptops, the mobile phones, mm. they're all just a medium for us to produce data. And uh, I think this also one of the world's biggest now uh, companies, mm. Microsoft, it's not a software company anymore, make the point clear. For us, it's cloud first, mobile first. Yeah. Why do you need mobile devices? To create the data, where? To save it in the cloud. Mm. So this brings me to the next question. Actually, which I'm going to answer myself. <laughs> <laughs> what is a data archetype? We once, okay, we create the data, or American style, you know, data. Mm. Um, we have three types of data. Data in REST is where we use computer forensics, yeah. right? We have it inside the flash drive. We, that's the data which is resting. It could be in mm. a NAS, could be in the cloud. Yes, I know. Many questions you ask, keep asking this question, which we're going to cover later. Yeah. Oh, is the cloud going to kill my job? Now, <laughs> they used to ask me this in IT pro classes, developing classes. Now they started to ask this in uh, forensics classes. Mm. And my answer is always the same, no. Uh, the only difference is you are not doing analysis on a computer anymore. But you can obtain uh, rights from Microsoft yeah. to do uh, your own forensic analysis into a cloud, which is stored in their data. Then we have data and execution, which we're mm. going to cover in the next module, yeah. which is memory forensics. Why memory? Because it's like our memory. Everything is kept in the memory, mm. right? Mm. And uh, you're going to show us a nice demo how we can obtain keys, passwords, yeah. and many other stuff on memory. Then we have also data in transit. Mm. What is this? This is where we use uh, network forensics. So beautiful. You have you, you have the cloud, and the data in between. The connection in between, yeah. So sometimes we have to do online. Sometimes we have to do offline. Mm. This, again, we're going to cover in the upcoming modules. Yeah. But saying that, here's a good example. Uh, we have our. Excel file may be stored in a USB. As soon as you plug it into a computer, mm. it will leave traces in the registry, right? We know Windows, uh, even with Windows 10, uses the registry as the backbone to store data. That's right. Uh, if it's in a network environment, what will happen is, uh, let's say now you have it in your hard drive, you are uploading it to your Azure server and to your data center at the end, 
nothing is changing really. The only change is you have your NIC, which transits the data, and instead of having registry shortcuts, you're gonna have uh, transaction logs in your yeah. database. And at the end, it's gonna be stored in the memory regardless during that period. Mm. All right, before I go to the summary, yeah. Hassan, uh, now we had three types of topics today. First, the security landscape. Mm. Then, I, uh, we covered uh, together the importance of Windows security. Yeah. Then, we covered the importance of forensics. Mm. Can you please show me, I mean, it used to be all CMD, now, PowerShell, yeah. <laughs> can you please show us how people, bad people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. can abuse PowerShell yeah. and use the power of the PowerShell to harm people. So mm -hmm. again, we are not trying to show you how you can hack people, we are trying to show you how hackers yeah. can hack you. And please, Check this them out because Hussein is one of the best in his field, which I always respect. And if you watch any of my talks, I always mention about them. And special thanks, he came here. Can you please uh, show us a mm -hmm. quick demo sure. on PowerShell? Yeah, um, yeah. Just as Erdal said, PowerShell is used very often today to manage systems and especially remote management. And we don't see that out if a technic. I mean, a, a, an admin guy receive something and they need to run a PowerShell script or so, they are getting more used to PowerShell scripts. So they are not really uh, that careful about what's happening if I do execute some PowerShell script here and there. And the other, the other nice thing with PowerShell is that you can do some really nifty things like executing stuff directly in memory, which will never touch in uh, your, your hard drive. You will hardly see any evidence of, of those things getting executed. It just ran my, uh, our uh, Ignite session. Yeah. Um, yeah. Based on scenario, Hussein and uh, his uh, good friend partner hacked me yeah. during the session. It was scenario, okay? Um, no problem. Then one of the, we had cl close to a few thousand people mm. there, right? Mm. And one of the people, it's, you can go and watch it on Channel 9 and said, hey, yeah. it's a scenario, hack me if you can live. <laughs> we invited her to the stage and we hacked her live in the stage. Yeah. So it uh, can be happen anywhere, anytime, mm. but how? Yeah, let us just uh, go through this. So if you focus my computer, I'm using a, a tool or a toolkit uh, called Metasploit. Which is free. Which Metasploit, yeah, it's free. It's an exploitation framework. It's a penetration testing framework. So you can extend that. You can use whatever on board. Uh, there are so-called payloads and exploits. You can push different kind of executables to different kind of machines, operating systems. This is not only restricted to Windows. This is all over the scale, all, all kind of operating systems, Unix-based, um, uh, BSD-based, and so forth. So uh, we're going to go through a scenario where we'll, we'll prepare for a PowerShell attack, and then we will be using that PowerShell attack in, in our system. So let me just pick up my demo script. I'm using Metasploit, as I said before. I'm going to set up a handler, uh, which is actually a, a command and control server. So with these instructions, when I put them in, in Metasploit, I will create a command and control center on my system. So copy these guys and then just make sure I will paste them in. And then once uh, that is done, I need to tell it, hey, could you please execute and run that um, command and control center for me. Do you mind if I highlight uh, that using HTTPS? <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah, that's totally perfect. Um, so now I'm running that um, that control server in the background on this system. And a secure uh, server. <laughs> well, this could be a machine in Azure. This could be a machine on any cloud. Uh, it's basically listening on, on uh, TLS. Uh, the, the port it's listening on is 443. The handler itself is a reverse HTTPS, which means whenever somebody is getting attacked, they will connect back to me, to the attacker. That's the reverse HTTPS. There will be an outgoing connection from the local computer on that network to my system I'm setting up right now using TLS. So for any firewall, this looks like just a regular TLS connection, outgoing uh, uh, one, uh, to a system. It might be on a public cloud or something hosted anywhere. And once I'm done with that one, that's the server side part, uh, I will try go focus on my client. So the client 
uh, will be attacked or hacked using a simple PowerShell script or just PowerShell shell. Um, these are the instructions, and we use the versions that are not encoded right now, just to show you guys the effect of that. So I will be doing this with the non-encoded version. Normally, you will see this as an encoded, Base64 encoded string. So you will probably not understand it by just looking at it. You need to decode it back to its real text. But uh, for the purpose of this demo, we, yeah. we show it plain so you can understand That's it. That's perfect. So first of all, I'm going to be downloading the um, a small partial script and executing that directly in memory. So I'm, I will be doing that with this other guy over here. Here we go. That's the, the victim computer. So let me just download and execute the first part. So the victim goes to a website, or he downloads, or she downloads yeah. Yeah, anything. As you see here, this is getting downloaded. It's a text file that includes some PowerShell instruction, PowerShell scripts. It's, it's being downloaded from that address, and that could be a perfectly registered DNS uh, name and so. And then executing that in line with, with PowerShell. Now, let's see, just go back to my, where is it? There we go. And then the next step will be invoking the uh, shell code, which will be the reverse HTTPS, and we are uh, targeting uh, the control center and doing that over port 443. Uh, just to have a look at the control center, this is how it looks like right now. Sessions. Uh, we don't have any sessions established, no active sessions yet. So if uh, we because go, you didn't download the client? Yeah, no, nothing has been actively um, using that. And just remember, this is um, a live demo we are Did doing here. Did you chicken this morning? <laughs> Let's see, I want to get back to that and copy that line. And go back to victim machine, and then just paste that and run it. <coughs> so whilst this is running, uh, we can go back now to our attacker. And, and we run the session again? should see sessions going on here. We don't have it. Okay, we just, uh, as I said, this is a live demo and things could happen in a live demo. I just repeat this on my local machine. So I'm just jumping forth and back between this and my other machines. That looks a little bit better, I guess, yes. And here we go. So it didn't work on the virtual machine I use, but uh, when I did it on my local machine, it worked better. So as you can see here, it received the connection from the victim, the client I was attacking. Um, current server process is PowerShell EXE, and now it's moving that to explorer.exe, uh, simply because if the, the victim closes the PowerShell process, we will still have a persistent connect connection to that machine. Um, so this is our sessions going on. And right away I see this is this is the computer name is PC. The logged in username is Hassan Lashakarti. Obviously, this is my own workstation. And then we do have information about connected IP addresses and so forth. Sorry, when you say your own, is it your own your own or is it the <laughs> <laughs> Well, virtually yes. <laughs> uh, so I do jump into that session and within the metaprinter I can do just a shell uh, command over there. And I will just get a regular command prompt. Uh, so who am I? And this is the this is just a regular Windows machine. I'm there, IP config. Yeah, so everything I'm doing right now in this context it's is from the victim. From that victim machine. I'm, you can create I, some uh, I have access files. to the whole network. I have access to the file shares. I have access to everything that users just have access to. So let's just go back to my machine again and see if I close down the PowerShell, if I close down everything else, uh, it will still maintain that access. I'm, I'm still there. I can just list files and, and work with file folders and, and files and processes and in, in, uh, in that system, uninterrupted. Uh, so I do have a permanent access to that uh, machine now uh, using this kind of technique. So you can plant a rootkit or a Trojan or virus yeah. and you can maintain the access, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, and then we can control that forever and ever again. So that's uh, 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 the way the attackers are using PowerShell today to remotely control the systems. That's, that's what we see in, in the wild. Um, uh, out there on the internet. 
And this is totally unobserved. Right now, it's totally unobserved by antivirus because antivirus are not looking that deep within the, the PowerShell power process or anything, any kind of automation or script engines running in our systems today. Uh, we know that Microsoft is working on this. Uh, it has been announced for a good while ago that the new um, um, antivirus engine uh, together with the new PowerShell engine will have uh, connection points that we will start looking at this. It reminds me of uh, VBScript. Mm. If you remember, you used to be able to create a VBScript and you just double click and it was causing yeah. problems, yeah. which was fixed with PowerShell. Yeah. But now, um, you guys, or us, we <laughs> find always a different way. And that's what I keep telling my customers. Uh, mm. We are, I mean, hackers are always a step ahead because yeah. We, I mean, me as Chief Information Security Officer at EMT Holding, I have thousands of applications, hundreds of users that mm. have to take care, and it's me and my security team. Yeah. But you, as Hussein, at TrueSec, you have hundreds of clients with 10,000 of users, yeah. with 100,000 of applications, where hackers Only uses one, one application, yeah. unlimited time, unlimited budget. Yeah. Once they succeed, they make yeah. unlimited money. Yeah. Um, let's come to the summary. Mm? Windows, it's getting great, especially mm. Windows 10. Server 2016, it's getting great. Yeah. Azure, cloud, Lumia fonts, beautiful. Mm. Hard drives, forensic was a bit easier. Why? We used to have a hard drive, clusters, everything used to be written in the cluster. Yeah. And if you delete something, it was still resisting the data, but what used to happen is it was just unmarked, ready to, mm -hmm. or written. Mm -hmm. Today, we go to flash. It's a bit different. Yeah. Flash drives, not flash uh, software. Mm. Uh, things are written in pages, but still similar. So forensic is still important. Forensic is still helping us yeah. to gain the information. A, to be able to present in a court. Mm. B, to learn from it. See, that's how we do our yeah. demos, right? Yeah. We, uh, I know they're good on finding zero days, and they found a couple of zero days. He's not, you know, he's a shy person uh, in a big <laughs> bank in Europe. Where, uh, how you can find it? This is how you have to do forensics mm. to be able to look into this. Yeah. And we demonstrated you what PowerShell, uh, what hackers can do with PowerShell. How it to can be harm abused, you. yeah. Mm. And with this, we're coming to the end of this topic, but don't go away anyway. Feel free to have a break. The next session will be about uh, Windows authentication. Uh, sorry, first we're going to do memory, memory. memory attacks. It's a good course. You're going to enjoy it. We're looking forward to see you again. Mm.